Hello everyone. It's me Rushil Rongta once again. Having interviewed a few leaders who have come up with very unique business ideas, I was curious to talk to someone the purpose of whose business is to maximize the well-being for the underprivileged. I understand the importance of doing things to help others, but I'm very keen to know how to make a big impact on other people's lives. Therefore, today I'm delighted to welcome Ms. Radha Nazran, CEO of Accelerate Global, a social enterprise that tackles youth and unemployment issues amongst the underprivileged. Ms. Radha was recently recognized by Tatler Asia as Generation T Leader of Tomorrow Honorary 2020, making her one of the 400 young leaders shaping Asia's future. Ms. Radha also sits on various advisory boards from charities to the Curriculum Development Board of Malaysia's Polytechnic and College Community. Welcome, Ms. Radha. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you so very much, Rushil. I feel incredible despite the lockdown. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining my show. So let me get on to my burning questions. So you studied law in the United Kingdom and turned down several job offers after you returned to Malaysia to start Accelerate Global in 2019 at the age of 23. How did your parents react to this decision and were they happy or disappointed? It was a very very good question Rashil and I think that's a really good first question because I'm pretty sure you know whenever people hear that oh my god she graduated and she should have just started a business you know how how was the reaction right I think everyone's very curious about it and yeah. um, I I feel very blessed and and I'm very much eternally grateful because my mother is so very supportive of me and so when I told her that I decided to start a social enterprise um she did question that she was just merely probing me with meaningful and constructive questions in terms of the sustainability of the business idea which to me is is really crucial because when you want to start a business obviously re- you require all these insights from multiple different people and i think she she was really helpful in terms of actually making me understand um what does it take to ensure that accelerate global is sustainable so mm. i i had full support from my mother Uh, full support uh, from my brother and um, full support from my husband as well or well, we then boyfriend but now my husband um and then even my grandparents despite sort of you know the generational gap uh, so so we say but i think uh, what was really interesting was the fact that the people outside were talking a lot you know so oh. as opposed to like family <laughs> they think they've got a say and so uh, i remember my grandmother telling me that people were coming to her gate because she lives in a residential area and then they they very much invested in what I do you know because they know I studied in the UK and I remember when I told my grandmother that, okay you know what I've decided to reject all the job offers I got and start to accelerate and uh, when she told that you know to her friends and to the neighbors because they were constantly asking so what's next for Auda and when she told them that they were really really you know weird it out for some weird reason and then they came to her gate and say oh my god we cannot believe she rejected all the job offers that's absolutely insane what is she doing so i think in terms of like family support it's there uh, they love it they've been supporting me up until today it's the people you know and i think mm. i always tell um, when i was speaking panels i always say don't listen to people any other you know, day it's what you believe in it's what you believe uh, you're capable of doing so yes Well said Miss Radha I think I guess I mean like I guess every parent has some expectation from their child but at the end of the day they just come around and happy as long as the child is happy and I think um, just uh, don't listen to what others think and just do what you like doing so I agree with you on that point So now on to my second question I have also participated in several charitable programs but I've always looked at them as something in addition to studies or work. I have never thought about them as a career. So how and why did you think of making this as a career? A good question, incredible. So, um to be very honest with you, Rushul, I have the same thought as you. 
uh, before I went to the UK. So throughout my you know, high school years, I've always been involved in charity work. In fact, just to share with you, when I was 18, I started a foundation and that was solely a, an NGO, you know, a non-profit organization where we focus on helping the homeless, the elderly, and the orphanages at the time. And so because we were a non-profit organization, you know, obviously funds run dry at the end of the day. And so I never thought of actually having that as a career. And it has always just been a side thing. I do it after school. I do it, you know, uh, when, when I was doing my A-levels, I did that after examinations and so and so forth. Mm. Um, things started to change when I went to the UK. Um, and this, I must thank my government because without the scholarship, I won't be flying there and I wouldn't know. Uh, about this social entrepreneurship concept. So when I was in the UK, I learned about uh, the idea and the concept of social entrepreneurship as a sustainable way of pursuing um, charitable activities, not charity, but charitable activities and essentially creating a change in the world. And mm -hmm. so because the whole concept of social enterprise is the fact that you are a business but you are a social business. So you are dedicating your whole business to creating change and empowering the lives of the people. Mm. And, and so and I was really mesmerized, right? So I, I heard about it and I'm like, what? I don't know if this can work. So I worked for that social enterprise in the UK for about three years. Um, I fell in love with the concept because it was not just about helping others, but it's also ensuring that the business is sustainable, thus allowing you to essentially obviously generate income for yourself and providing employment for, you know, the rest of the other people and essentially building an ecosystem. And I thought that was really beautiful. Um, and that's when my thoughts changed and I thought this can be a career because of the social entrepreneurship. Um, element. Um, obviously, there are, I mean, I've got friends who work in the nonprofit uh, sectors, and I, I cannot speak on behalf of them because I don't really understand how it works. But if we talk about social enterprise or social entrepreneurship ecosystem, it is a career because it's a business. It's just it's not a full on for profit business. It's a social business. Mm. That's very interesting to know. And. The next time I volunteer with any charitable organization, I'm sure to view things from a different angle. So from what you said, I'm just uh, thinking out loud. So you almost found, found your calling in uh, UK when you went to the UK. Am I right? Yes, yes, precisely. Mm, okay. So on to my next question. How was your experience in setting up Accelerate Global? Like, did you face any challenges or difficulties? Oh yes, of course. I think anyone who says they don't face any challenges, you know, is, is, is not really being honest. Um, in any businesses, I think, or in any sort of career, you know, we always face challenges. And I think with Accelerate, there were many challenges. Uh, but I think there are two challenges that I want to share with you today, because I think these two are the ones that actually paved my way uh, to become who I am today. So the first challenge was this um, stigma. And, and I was one of the victims, obviously, you know, that when you want to start a business, you need and you require big capital. And so, you know, uh, living in Malaysia, and I think it's also the perspective that people give you, you know, they say, oh, when you want to start a business, obviously you need capital. And so I was, I, I became a victim, I think for about a month thinking, how exactly can I garner capital? How exactly can I gather the capital for Accelerate Global? Um, but then, you know, I realized that after talking to a couple of advisors and then people in the industry, I realized that there is a concept called the zero cost strategy in which you can actually start your business with zero capital. And mm -hmm. so that's what I did. Yes, just to share with you, Rochelle. Um, so I started Accelerate with zero capital. I remember running my first uh, career workshop, personal growth career workshop in June 2019, where I got the venue sponsored. So the venue was free. Um, the food was also free. And so I charged the workshop 30 ringgit, Malaysian ringgit, um, which is about like nine USD, $9. Um, and, and I actually managed to get 20 participants. And so my first net profit at the time, without putting any capital, except, you know, my blood, sweat and tears, obviously, I got 600 ringgit, which is about $100 
so to say, plus pointers. And so that was my first net profit without capital. And I realized that, you know, although the first time around when I, when I, went, when I, when I wanted to start Excel, the challenge was thinking about funding. I sort of managed to overcome it by by talking to people, by talking to the people in the industry, by actually, you know, opening up myself and actually receiving that feedback from from the from the experts. Let's just call it that, right? Uh, and so I managed to get the net profit, and I sort of just mimic that, and then uh, you know, here we are today, um, having actually profit. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge, and and this is a challenge that I'm still uh, facing. To be very honest with you, Rochelle, it is um, to actually be consistent and steadfast. Um, you know, when you are a founder and when you start your own business, there are pro and cons. Obviously, the pro is, you know, your schedule is yours. There's no nine to five. You know, you work anytime you want. You wake up at eleven, start working, you sleep at two o'clock, and so on and so forth. Um, but I realized that when you want to achieve your milestone and when you want to achieve your target, you need to be able to be disciplined and stay focused and actually be steadfast and consistent with with a couple of elements that make up the business. And a lot of times, I find myself when you know I think it's important for us to be vulnerable as well because I believe vulnerability is a sign of strength. So this is me being vulnerable to you. So um, there are times where I I don't really you know I'm not consistent. Mm. And and so it's it's really difficult because you're you know you're in your bubble it's your own company, uh, but the way I actually overcome that there are two ways I combated that. So the first one is obviously setting um, setting realistic to do list every day. I think a lot of times you know when we talk about creating to do list or checklist, a lot of times people sort of just oh this is what I want to do, but sometimes it's not realistic, and so you end up having like. Um, uh, to-do list that's not checked, and right? also half checked, which is obviously not mm. as intriguing, right? So I started making realistic checklists, which helps me essentially to sort of go through the day. And another thing I did as well was I I focused on understanding how I operate as a person. Mm. I believe that everyone operates differently. So, for example, I might be a night owl, you might be an early bird. Right, and everyone has got different style of working. Everybody operates differently. The key um, element of consistency and the key element of essentially being steadfast uh, mm-hmm. in what you wish to do is actually to understand how you operate. When you're an entrepreneur, there's a lot of energy um, that you give out, and so you need to be able to manage your energy because if your energy is not well managed, that's when inconsistency happens as well. Uh, and so I managed to understand how I operate, and I sort of just focused on that. Um, obviously, sometimes you know I, I neglect it. Um, sometimes I'm not consistent, but I think it's 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 a um, it's a journey, I must say. So those mm-hmm. are perhaps the two challenges that 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 I believe um, that I believe are what you know sort of paved me, or paved my journey, and 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 shaped me to who I am today. In fact, uh, just a fun fact: I'm actually an early bird. I'm the first one to wake up in my family every, uh, even on weekends. Wow! But, uh, apart from that, even in my opinion, I feel discipline is really an important factor in whatever you do, yeah. and it's really commendable how you have fought all the odds to do what you do. And I will certainly remember this when I try to achieve anything that I set my mind to. So, so now moving on to the next question. I have read that you are extremely passionate about providing education and employment for the underprivileged youth. To do this well, you would need a team that is equally passionate as you. So, how did you find your team members, and who have the same vision? Very good question. Um, I did not find my team member up until last year, October. Really? Yep. Yeah. So I started Accelerate in June 2019, right? Um, but from June 2019 up until October 2020, I was struggling to find the people that are as equally passionate or even more passionate. Uh, the reason why I say more passionate is because I believe as founders of startups or social enterprise, it's important for you to hire people that are better than you and they're more passionate than you because that's how the businesses grow. Um, and so throughout like I think one and a half year, I was struggling to find the right people and the right candidate. Um, and I think this is also something that's worth sharing. It is okay for you to recruit wrongly, because that's how you're going to learn. 
Um, so I have been in the social entrepreneurship ecosystem for about four, five years now. So three years in the UK, two years in Malaysia. And I realized that when you want to recruit the people that are as equally passionate or that are more passionate than you, there are two things that you need to take into account. The first one is you need to manage your expectations. Um, it is almost impossible for you to find people that are as equally passionate as you because you are the founder. Mm. As a founder, you've got an emotional connection to your business. The emotional connection that, you know, that cannot be, or that, that can't be created by just anyone else unless you're the founder of your own organization. And I think this is just human nature, you know, when it's your baby, when, when you created it, you love it more than any other people can ever love, something like that, right? So that's that's like the analogy. And so I think the first most important element is when you interview candidates, you don't find another you, but you find a person who is interested, who is passionate in social justice, like, uh, you know, in, 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 in now work. So we find people who are passionate in social justice and who are just genuine in wanting to do what they want to do. So I think managing that expectation is very, very important. So when you manage your expectations as such, you'll be able to find candidates or, you know, people who are really, really passionate at the end of the day. Because when you try to find someone like you, someone who's passionate, someone who loves the entity as you, it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. So when I sort of manage my expectations, that's when I found uh, not just the correct candidates, but also I found my peace. You know, because when I hire people and then with such a high expectation and then they don't meet them, I get frustrated and then it affects me terribly. So mm. when I manage my expectation, it's, it's a win-win. Uh, I get my peace and I also get people who are really, really good. And the second thing is to assess the candidates, not just based on the interview, because I don't do that. So I personally interview sessions that oh my, you know, I do it sometimes. I let my special associate does it. Um, in fact, just to share with you, Rachel, I don't do interviews anymore. Um, what I do is I call them for a chat. And so pre-pandemic, what I really love to do is I call these candidates um, to you know restaurants, right? And uh, I observe their etiquettes. I've seen those scenes in movies. Ah, yes! <laughs> and calls to the restaurant and all that. <laughs> right? Yes, yeah, so I observe the etiquette where uh, whether they put back the chair, right? So, you know, when you stand up and then you sort of the chair just goes all the way back, do you put it back? <laughs> do you say thank you to your waiter? Right. Um, how how do you how do you converse with the waiter? Mm. I think that's very important because how you treat the waiter is who you are as a person. How can I hire someone who does not even say thank you, or who does not even respect the waiter into an organization that is all about social justice? Mm, mm, true. Right. So that's essentially how I do it, and that's how I I find the um, creme de la creme. I I, I can say for accelerate. Mm. So that's really interesting to hear. But uh, one more question I want to ask you related to this. So why do you think a team is really important? And how do you, uh, why is a team of people who have a common goal important or more beneficial to whatever you're doing? Number, there are two. Number one, it's because the Accelerate Global is here for the people. Mm. If we don't hire the right team who has a heart for the people, then who am I kidding, right? <laughs> then I'm not serving the people. Because the whole ultimate goal, the whole value of Accelerate is essentially the people. We are here to serve the underprivileged. We are here to serve the marginalized. You need to be able to have a team who has the heart for it. If you only have, you know, because uh, I've, I've um, just to share with you, Rusha, I've, I've had an experience of actually working with people who does it for the fame and popularity. Oh. You know, they join social enterprises or they join charity organizations because they feel like, you know, um, you get the spot. I'm doing something good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and because, you know, they like the media appearances. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, A is doing great, something like that. So, I've worked with people like that and believe me, they, because that's what they chase, you know, the empowerment for the people is ignored. Mm. 
And so that's the first reason. The reason why we need to build, you know, the right team is because for the right reasons. You know, I'm here for the people. If I don't hire people who love the people, then it's it basically it just doesn't connect. The synergy is not there. So that's the first one. Um, and the second one, I believe, is you know you need to have a great team because at the end of the day, I personally feel that. I don't want to be creating change alone in the world. You know, we need to be spreading that kindness. We need to be collaborating. We need to be partnering because at the end of the day, um, you know, we are strong as one, but we are stronger together. Mm. I think that's very, very important. As the founder of a social enterprise, and I'm not just talking about myself, but you know, for, for the rest as well, or for you, if you are looking to build a social enterprise, it's important for you to think ahead 10, 20 years down the road, when you may be no longer around in the world, who will continue the legacy? That's mm -hmm. very important. If you don't have a team, then your organization won't have a legacy. So when you have a team, you're able to essentially develop the next leaders and i think that's very very crucial especially when you work for uh, you when you when you're all about social justice because the the the, the legacy needs to be continued isn't it you cannot just oh uh, i'm gonna be forever you know i'm gonna forever be the ceo <laughs> you can't do that yes mm, okay you are absolutely right and i got similar responses from other leaders i've interviewed that you know the core team with a common purpose with the right mindset is really extremely important so moving on you have always been fearless about voicing your opinion against injustice great leaders like martin luther king jr nelson mandela and mahatma gandhi have all been known for speaking out against injustice and for equality so how can my i mean how can kids of my age develop this quality very very good question well i think it begins um now i don't know if you if your father's gonna agree with me on this but i think he does because you are speaking up right now mm -hmm. and, and he's done an absolutely amazing job it's important i mean i think there, there are two elements here obviously right so the youth and the parents i think when it comes to developing the next generation of responsible leaders i really love to say this in any panel we are not here to create the next generation of leaders. We are here to create the next generation of responsible leaders. Uh, and to do that, it's important, you know, for parents to also play a role. Um, and, and I look up to your father because basically he's developed such an incredible leader, such as, such as yourself. So I think that question is a little bit redundant because you're already speaking up, Rachel. So <laughs> but yes, yeah, so I think that the parent um, plays a really important role in actually molding um, youthers or, or kids or even children who are fearless in terms of speaking up, um, you know, for justice because it's very, very important. Uh, as for the youth, um, number one, so I, I always tell this when I speak to our beneficiaries because a lot of them ask, you know, how can we speak up um, when we see injustice? Mm. So two things. Number one is mode of speaking up or method of speaking up. And the second thing is self-reflection. So let's go to the first one. So when I say mode of speaking up, um, it's important for youthers and, and children and kids to understand that when you want to speak up for an act of injustice or for any injustice act that's happening out there, it's important to do it um, politely and diligently. And what I mean is, that, as you know, you know, I'm sure you know this. There's a lot of cyber bullying going on out there. There yeah. are a lot of you know harassment comments and all this nonsense. Um, and and whilst they are quote unquote fighting for the injustice, the question that we need to ask ourselves is: Is this creating a change? Right. Mm -hmm. So you commenting on let's say an Instagram post fighting for injustice, um, will that create? change so i'm going to give you an example do you think commenting on instagram will create change or do you think writing a pleasant insightful article for a news outlet will create change which one of these um, i mean like i'm just thinking an article would be nicer like a good article more information but then again 
thinking about you children they're always on instagram they're not going to read articles yeah so if i'm going to have to raise more awareness then i would probably use the instagram way. yeah yeah understand so essentially so uh, i love your answer so essentially what's really meaningful and impactful essentially is this news article right and so if we want to embed that onto the digital platform we can perhaps write um uh, on instagram you know how like people have insta story now and you sort of yes. write you know insightful um uh, feedback or insightful comments on a certain issues and what i mean by writing insightful comments or insightful feedback about certain issues is not gaslighting um the issue but rather finding solutions to the issue at hand mm. right and so i think that's very very important uh, just to give you an example right now i'm not sure whether you know about the political scene in malaysia i'm sure your dad knows about it though it's insane where you know people are asking for the prime minister to resign while really? i understand oh yeah while i understand the frustration um i believe it is irrelevant for the people to make hateful comments on instagram just because it's not creating any change what i believe would create change is for the youth the children or the, or the, even the kids to actually write their thoughts down whilst also proposing a solution and actually post that on blogs or on insta stories or even send it out to news outlet because right now you know we've got a lot of um digital um platforms mm-hmm. for news right so those are the kind of things that perhaps youth is you this can do so that's the first one and the second one essentially is 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 reflecting i think it's important um an element of being fearless comes from within and so what i mean by that is when you want to speak up about something it's important for you to first and foremost check on yourself have i ever done that you know would i ever do that mm what would i do to not do that in the future and so when you reflect on yourself it is more meaningful than just sort of you know speaking up why because when you reflect on yourself and when you understand yourself when you do speak up later on you speak with not just words but you speak with integrity mm-hmm. for instance there are a lot of issues in malaysia i'm just going to give you one example so um again let's say the pol- the, po- the politics right so you're asking uh the prime minister to resign and so the first question is okay um would i if i'm in his shoes what would i do to make the country better right and so then you start brainstorming okay maybe i'm going to roll out the vaccination a certain way maybe i'm going to um you know make the lockdown tighter and so on and so forth because it's covid-19 right and so once you've reflected upon it and you know that you know what this is good and this is genuine then you write about it because then you write with respect and you write with integrity as opposed to just writing you know nonsense so that is something that i think is really important especially for the next generation again like i mentioned you know we're creating the next generation of responsible leaders and not just the next generation of leaders hmm that's nice that's really uh, insightful so essentially for the first uh, mode of uh, you know speaking up essentially you're saying we're so quick to complain and so many bad comments but instead we should take the time for to look for a solution and yeah. i mean like i'll certainly take inspiration from your advice and you know the different uh, ways i can uh, speak up and work towards being more vocal about anything i feel is wrong so um i hope y- the youth in malaysia can do something about that political uh, what is happening but um it is I mean, like, uh, oh, maybe i would ask you as well that question you asked me about instagram or article if you had to do what what would you choose I would definitely choose an article um oh, for okay. sure. Yeah, definitely. Um and why I mean it's not just the print article uh but also the digital article on news, mm-hmm. right? Um I know you guys have t- uh, Straits Times in Singapore and Straits Times Singapore has, you know, the digital um feature as well so where people just scroll and actually read and uh, I would most definitely choose that uh, because if anyone who knows me and who's listening to this they would know that I'm all about solutions if there is a problem let's not dwell on the problem for weeks right mm-hmm. maybe a day to sort of digest it 
But you know, you wake up the next day and think about, okay, you know the problem, you know the issue, let's think about the solution. Because at the end of the day, if no one talks about the solution, then 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 we're all doomed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, now the next question, number six. The kind of work that you do involves juggling between multiple proge- projects, pardon me, and doing different types of activities. So does this ever put you under pressure and how do you manage your time? Oh yes, of course. I feel like I'm pressured all the time. <laughs> Especially in this lockdown, you know, like I sleep, I wake up, I work and like there's no boundaries. So yes, Rochelle, I do feel pressured. And I'm not shy to say that because I think everybody else out there feels pressured as well with their own work. Um, I manage my time. I think this goes back to the point that I mentioned earlier by actually understanding how I operate. So, um, you know, again, what, what works for me does, you know, does not work for you. What works for you does not work for me. We don't know. So the way I manage my time is um, on projects is I understand, let's say, for example, um, this the first week of August, I've got three projects to take on. And I know for a fact that my body cannot take more than three projects. So I will keep it at three projects and I will continue the rest of the project the next coming week. Mm-hmm. And that's what I've done. Um, and, and, and this is because, you know, I, I, I managed to do this because I've worked on understanding how I operate for about four years and so now i'm finally getting it you know i'm finally getting it and so what i tell the clients and what i tell our partners is okay um the slots are full for the first week of august um if you wish to proceed let's place that project in the second week of august Um, that's how i manage my time Um, and actually having people to understand and appreciate your energy is also very very important Mm, so knowing about your experience will really help children of my age in multitasking and especially now that uh, we primary six children are uh, preparing for the national level examinations so mm-hmm. multitasking and managing pressure is uh, really really important yeah so on to our last question giving back to society and doing things that impact other people's lives are values that are taught to us in school You are a champion in this field and so it would be great to get some tips from you on how kids like me can make a difference in other people's lives. You start, you know, you start with the small things. Um, Rusha, what you are doing now is already creating and changing people's lives. So, well done to you, right? (laughs) So, well, to, to, to the youthers out there who are listening to this, definitely take Rusha as an example. Because he is already creating change right here. So it's a small thing. So I think when we talk about wanting to create change, it is important to break down what change means, right? I think when we talk about, I want to create a change to the world, a lot of times people think it's the big, big things, but actually it's the small little things. Um, you know, if you want to change someone's life, it's as simple as do you smile to the security to the security guards at your res- residential area, right? Mm. Do you perhaps give some food to them? You know, maybe when you're at the grocery store, you buy yourself a bar of chocolate, right? And the kindness, the act of kindness, or the act of creating change begins with you know what? I'm gonna buy an extra chocolate just to give to the security guard that's been taking care of my residential area. Those kind of little things essentially spark bigger change. Mm. So for people of your age or younger or in primary school, right? The things that you can start with is the small, small things. Well, even, you know, like, you know what, let me buy a chocolate for my teacher just to say thank you for all the efforts that that, that, Mm -hmm. that she's, she's, she's been giving us for teaching. So one day you go and buy chocolate and say, hi teacher, this is for you. Um, Just to say thank you for everything that you've done for us. I know it's not teacher's day yet, but you know, hey, we appreciate you. Things like that matters Mm. a lot. That's where change begins. Mm. Those are really useful tips. And uh, the good thing is it really complements what we learn in our service learning lessons at school where we are taught about different ways we can give back to the community. 
so thank you very much ms rada for giving me your time sharing your experiences and imparting such meaningful advice and i wish you all the best thank you so very much rishu it was an honor to be speaking to you thank you so much ms rada